Uh, so I'm going to talk how to handle uh, leakage in encrypted search. So this is a joint work with Seni Kamara and Olya Ohrimenko. So um, uh, structured encryption was introduced by Chase and Kamara in 2010. And it's a cryptographic primitive that encrypts the data structure in such a way that the user can privately query it later. So at a high level, it works as follows. There is a setup algorithm that takes as input a security parameter and the data structure, and it puts a key and an encrypted data structure that it's sent to the server. At query time, the user will run a, a token algorithm that will take as input a key, a query, and will output a token that it's sent to the server. Then at query time, the server will run a query algorithm that takes as input the token and the encrypted data structure and output an answer that is sent to the user. So, we call the information that the server learns about the data structure at setup time the setup leakage, and we call the information that the server learns about the data structure and queries the query leakage. And at a higher level, we say that a structured encryption is LSLQ secure if, for one, it doesn't reveal any information about the data structure uh, beyond the setup leakage, and for two, it doesn't reveal any information about the data structure and the queries beyond the query leakage. And uh, for more uh, precise and formal security definition, please check the CK10 page. So, examples of uh, uh, structured encryption include uh, encrypted multimaps, encrypted dictionaries, encrypted graphs, encrypted arrays, and so on and so forth. These are building blocks that one can use to design higher level applications such as encrypted relational databases, encrypted non-SQL databases, symmetric searchable encryption, uh, garbled circuits, privacy preserving network provenance, and so on and so forth. So when we design a structured encryption, there are actually three main criteria that one wants to optimize on, and are efficiency, expressiveness, and security, okay? So when it comes to efficiency, and in SSE in particular, uh, achieving optimal search was the first uh, milestone. Then several work followed to achieve dynamism and optimal search dynamic STE construction. And recently this year, there were several work that, uh, uh, that targeted the designing IO efficient construction, in particular achieving better search, locality, and storage uh, trade-offs. Uh, by the way, the two talks uh, later in the session will be on how to achieve better trade-offs. Um, so with respect to expressiveness, so research started with single keyword SSC, single keyword being the most fundamental search query. Um, then uh, several work investigated other settings such as multi-user SSC uh, and more expressive queries such as Boolean SSC and range queries. So with respect to security, there were actually a couple of work that tried to investigate different adversarial models such as active adversaries uh, and snapshot adversaries. There were also uh, several work that investigated attacks on SSC. And also recently, there were a lot of focus on how to design forward uh, secure and backward secure uh, SCE construction. So as we can see, uh, efficiency, expressiveness, and several dimensions of security uh, have been greatly investigated. However, uh, leakage was the main area that didn't receive a lot, uh, receive a lot of attention and which, for which we don't have uh, a good understanding. So we have identified three main directions that we believe that they will help us to better understand leakage in structured encryption and which are, first, cryptanalysis. Cryptanalysis, what we mean by that is the area that will design um, attacks for a specific leakage profile under some specific assumptions. Uh, and and the two query attacks, for example, that we are aware of, the IKK and the count attack, will require, for example, the, uh, will require the co-occurrence pattern. However, they will rely on very strong assumptions such as the knowledge of more than 80% of the user's data and also around 5% of the user's query. Okay? The second dimension is leakage quantification. And at a very high level, what we mean by that is uh, are ways how to measure uh, leakage. And the third dimension, which we believe is the most important dimension among the three, uh, is leakage reduction. And by which we mean, at a high level, uh, uh, studies ways how, how to reduce leakage. This, is the foc this was the focus of our work, and this will be the focus of this talk. So before starting detailing our contribution, uh, a valid question to ask ourselves is that, are there already ways to reduce leakage? And the answer to this question is yes, there are. And oblivious RAM simulation is one of the main ones. 
and by oblivious RAM simulation, uh, we mean a technique that will take at a high level read and write operation and will replace them by a polylogarithmic read and uh, write operation in a specific way. It has, you know, two main advantages. The first one is being generic uh, in, the, in that, that it can apply to any RAM program and therefore achieving any level of expressiveness. The second advantage is that it has a very small leakage profile. However, the downside are it's interactive and unfortunately, it doesn't scale to very large data sets. So there are also other approaches such as garbled RAM and customized schemes. And for more details, please uh, check uh, our paper. So refor reformulating the question. So the question that we want to answer is, are they more efficient ways to suppress leakage? And before uh, detailing our, our, uh, our contribution, uh, let me introduce some background. <laughs> so when we first started working on this paper, we have noticed that the terminology and the formalism of leakage in, structured in, in the literature was sometimes uh, con inconsistent and even contradictory. So the first thing that we did is to, to address this problem. So we have introduced a more intuitive nom uh, nomenclature and more precise description of leakage. So I, I will present just a subset of these leakage patterns, the ones uh, that I'm going to, uh, to use in my talk. So first, query equality, which is known as the search pattern in literature is the leakage uh, that leaks uh, if and when a query is repeated. The response identity, known as the access pattern in literature, is the leakage that consists of the responses of a specific query. The response length is simply the length of a response, while the sequence response length is the sum of responses length of a, of a sequence of queries. Okay? So the second thing that we, have, uh, we had to introduce is a new concept of leakage, which was necessary for our security analysis, which is the non-repeating sub-pattern. At a very high level, we view any pattern in two, uh, we divide any pattern in two parts, a non-repeating part and a repeating part, where the non-repeating part is equal to the leakage that occurs on non-repeating okay, uh, non queries, okay? And the, the repeating pattern is the leakage that will occur uh, on the other sequence of, uh, sequence of queries, okay? So for example, the query equality has a non-repeating pattern which is equal to nothing, okay? So, so now we, we are ready to dive into our, our techniques and at a very high level what we are proposing is a generic compiler that will suppress uh, the leakage of any structured encryption scheme. It works as follows. So consider that we have a structured encryption construction with a specific leakage profile, a setup leakage, and the query leakage here is equal to um, pattern one and pattern two. So we have this compiler that will suppress a pattern, a specific pattern, let's say here for this example, pattern two, and will output a structured encryption scheme with a new query leakage, which is only equal to pattern one, okay? So, in this talk and in our work, we focus in particular on how to suppress query equality. And by that we mean, let's consider a structured encryption scheme now, where the query leakage is equal now to the query equality and the an additional pattern. And we view the additional pattern in the non-repeating and the repeating form that I have described. Then we introduce what we call a, a new compiler that we call the cache-based compiler, or CBC for short. We will see the reason behind its name later on. And this CBC, when we run it, it will output a new construction, a CE construction with a leakage profile where the query leakage is only equal to the non-repeating sub-pattern of the pattern. We will see why this is important, okay? So actually, our techniques uh, and contribution are better represented in the form of a pipeline where our CBC actually suppress the query equality and the repeating pattern. So in terms of efficiency, which is uh, one of the most important things, our CBC uh, compiler will only induce an additive polylogarithmic overhead contrary to a multiplicative uh, polylogarithmic overhead in the case of ORAM simulation, okay? However, in order for this to work, uh, sorry, so in order for this to work, the, the CBC require, requires that the base STE construction has to be rebuildable. And as we know, most STE constructions are not rebuildable. So we had to um, introduce a new technique that we call rebuild uh, compiler, or RBC for short, that will make any STE construction rebuildable. And it has two main advantages. The first advantage is, uh, the, the first advantage is that it will preserve the, qu uh, the query leakage. So the query leakage, as you can note, is the same before and after compilation. 
The second advantage is just it preserves the scheme square efficiency. However, it will add a super linear rebuild cost. So another point that I want to emphasize here, which is notice that actually the leakage profile of our final construction in the pipeline is only equal to the non-repeating pattern. And, that, and this non-repeating pattern is actually equal to the non-repeating pattern of our first construction that we put in the pipeline. So what does it mean? It means if we want to achieve construction with very, very small leakage profile, it is actually sufficient to reduce the non-repeating pattern of our base construction. And based on this observation, we have designed a new construction that we call a uh, piggyback scheme, or PBS for short, that uh, as far as we know is the first construction that hides the response length. Uh, and uh, note that, for example, if we use ORAM simulation, it's not trivial to hide the response length without using some types of padding. And actually, this construction can be of independent interest, especially in the context of recent attacks on volume, vo using the volume pattern. Um, However, like the trade-off, it just, it, it does, it reduce a new trade-off. Uh, this construction introduces a new trade-off, which is query latency. On the other hand, so now in the pipeline, when we use PBS at the beginning of our pipeline, so we have now two constructions, two possible instantiations at the end of our pipeline. The first one is AZL, which has a query leakage, which is uh, equal to the sequence response length. Uh, so one thing that I want to emphasize here, this is a very, very small uh, amount of leakage. And the second construction is FZL, which doesn't leak anything. However, it doesn't achieve perfect correctness, okay? So let's now focus on uh, CBC compiler. So our approach to suppression was inspired and is based on the square root ORAM solution by Goldreich and Ostrowski that I recall here uh, very briefly. So we have a main memory and a cache that can hold up to lambda elements. And whenever the user wants to access an element, it always starts by reading the entire cache. And if the element doesn't exist, which is the case of, uh, of, of this example, it will go to the main memory, access the real element, and then insert it back in the cache. So le let's assume that the user wants to access the same element again. As I have said, we always start by reading the cache entirely. And here, in this case, the element already exists in the cache. So what the user do, it will just access a dummy element in the main memory and then insert it back in the, in the cache, OK? And after lambda accesses, the main memory is reshuffled and the cache is empty. So we have noticed, actually, that square root ORAM solution can be reinterpreted through the lens of structured encryption. And what, 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 do, you, what do we mean by that? So first notice that the main memory can be seen as an encrypted array, okay? And whenever we access an element, we access it through a PRP, which is a deterministic. So what does it mean? It means that whenever we access the same element, again, we will leak the query equality. On the other hand, the cache is actually an encrypted dictionary. And if you recall from the previous slide, uh, whenever we access the, this cache, we access it entirely. And basically, this is equivalent basically to, to building uh, uh, a zero leakage trivial dictionary. And by zero leakage, we mean that, uh, a, uh, that a dictionary that has as a query leakage nothing, okay? So let's assume now that the user accesses uh, the element indexed by, uh, that has index 15 so in, the, in the encrypted array. So if the user accesses, again, the same element, of course it will leak the query equality because we are evaluating the same PRP, okay? So square root ORAM solution, what it does is that it actually leverages the zero leakage queries to the zero leakage dictionary in order to suppress the query equality that's happening in the, in the, in the encrypted area, right? And we access a reader, a real and dummy element. So what we did is that we generalized, okay, the, the square root ORAM solution to, be, uh, to apply to more complex data structure, such as encrypted uh, multi-maps, encrypted dictionaries, and so on and so forth. However, in order to achieve that, we have identified several requirements. First one is that the encrypted data structure has to be rebuildable. Second one, the data structure has to be extendable and safe. And I will come in, this, in, in, the, in the next slide to what we mean by extendable and, and safety. And third, we want to design that the, we want that the base scheme has a very, very, very small non-repeating leakage. So for our approach to work over. So what do we mean by extension? By extension, we mean the fact that we want to add to the query space of the original data structure some element, dummy elements. And we call lambda extension if we add lambda dummies. 
uh, in a way that when we query the extended data structure using one of the dummy that we have added, the, the, the answer will be always equal to nothing, uh, done. So, well, this seems actually straightforward. Actually, it's not, because um, when one handles uh, dummies, he, d he needs to do it with care, especially that the leakage profile of the original construction was not designed while taking care of dummies. So actually, the leakage profile, if we are not very careful, might leak information that help the adversary to distinguish between a real and dummy element. So we introduce this notion of safety extension. And what we mean by that at a very high level is that uh, the setup leakage of the extended data structure leaks at most the setup leakage of the original data structure. And the query leakage of the extended data structure leaks at most the query leakage of the original data and with, it, with that, I'm um, done with the CBC, very high level. So unfortunately, we, have to, we don't have time to go over the RBC, so I will jump to PBS. So PBS uh, construction is based, on a, is based on a data transformation that works as follows. So I'm just taking for simplicity the case of a multi-map. So what we do, we have our multi-map, uh, where each la label is associated to a tuple with different sizes. Then we will pad this multi-map, the tuple of this multi-map with dummies in such a way that the size of each tuple is actually a multiple of a batch size that we have fixed, where the batch size here, for example, is just three, okay? So here we have padded with two, so the size now is six. Uh, we have padded now with the, the second label with one, the size is three, and here we don't have to pad because it's already three. Next, we will create a dictionary data structure where we will have uh, a batch uh, uh, an, an entry for every batch. So we will have two entries for the first label because we have six here, so we divided them in two, and then an entry for label two and an entry for label three. So uh, this is our dictionary structure that we have uh, generated. So the setup algorithm of PBS is very simple. So it takes as input a security parameter and our multi-map. It does the data transformation that I have presented, and it will output an encrypted dictionary, a key, and a state. And what is the state is that a simple dictionary that will keep locally the association between every label and the number of batches that we have generated. So for example, label, label one, the, the number of batches uh, is two. Label two is one, label three is one. So now consider that we have a query sequence, a query sequence um, composed of two uh, labels, label one and label two. So how does the token algorithm work? Uh, so the token algorithm takes a key uh, as an input, the state and, uh, and a label, label one in this case, because it's the first one. So the first thing that we do is we go to the state and we fetch the number of patches associated to label one. And here in this case is two. Then we instantiate a queue, a queue where we put in this queue two labels for the two batches. And then we just send the token for the first label, here, label one, to the server. And then we update the queue by eliminating whatever we have sent to the server. The get algorithm of PBS is simply running inside a get algorithm of the encrypted dictionary that will take as an input an encrypted dictionary and the, label, uh, and the token that we have sent and, we'll add, and it, will add, uh, it will output the answer, okay? So then, like, there is the second token that we want to apply on the second label. So now it's label two. So what we do is that, as, uh, as previously, we fetch the number of batches uh, from, from the state, which is one now, because label two is just associated to one, then we update the queue, okay? The queue with, as you can see, label two now, concatenated to one, just meaning that it, it has only one batch. So we just add it to the queue, then we run the token algorithm, but on the one remaining already. So we don't apply the token algorithm on the one that we have just taken as input. We need to first uh, query the, the previous label, and then we up, uh, output the token that is sent to the server, and then we update the queue, and then now the queue just contains the, the, the last uh, label. And then we just run, as previously, the get algorithm, and uh, you know, just run the encrypted dictionary get that will output the response. And finally, because we still have an element in the queue, we just run the token algorithm on nothing, just to flush the queue, okay? And simply, it will check just the, 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 the last label and output the token, and update the queue. Now the queue is empty. Uh, uh, the queue is empty. So then the, the get algorithm, which is as, as previously, ju just takes the token and out output the, the, uh, the, the response. So as you can notice, all responses has exactly size three, all of them. But if you have also noticed, 
we had a sequence of query composed of two queries, but we had to apply the token algorithm three times. So there is a notion of query latency. We need to wait to get our answers. So it's important then to, to, to study what is the, the latency or what is the latency of TPs. So in the, wor the worst case uh, sequence of uh, query sequence of size T has latency T times the maximum response length over the bus size minus one. Okay, and this happens when your query sequence is composed of labels that are associated to the maximum response length, all of them, okay? Just imagine, you know, all of them has the same maximum response length. However, unfortunately for us, this doesn't happen in, in, in practice. Actually, in real world settings, queries are, and the response length are zip distributed, okay? And in such a setting, we can show that actually the query latency is way, way smaller than that. And with high probability, we can show when we fix the right, uh, in, a, in a specific way, the parameter, okay? So before uh, I finish, I want just to give you like a very uh, high level idea about our AZL construction, just in terms of efficiency. So what I wanted to highlight in this slide is that we, were, we showed in this, in this work and in the paper that our techniques and AZL can be in terms of efficiency, a small O of, or, of the query efficiency of ORAM simulation. And there's some assumptions, of course. But these assumptions, you don't need to go over uh, you know, the details of these assumptions, like you can go over them later when you read the paper. But at a very high level, those are natural assumptions that we find in information retrieval. Like basically, you know, some assumptions about the way how queries are distributed, the response lines are distributed, okay? So to conclude, takeaways first. So we have introduced a new direction in encrypted search, which is the direction of leakage suppression, okay? Uh, we, we have introduced a general framework that suppresses the search pattern, you know, the query equality. Uh, we have uh, introduced the first solution that hides the response length, uh, known as the volume pattern uh, in, in, in literature. A general compiler that make any STE uh, rebuildable, which is also in, of independent interest, we can use again and again in future. And the first scheme that leaks at most the sequence response length, as, as I have said, this is a very small leakage, and we believe that it's very hard to exploit. Um, and the first scheme that leaks nothing, of course, nothing is between parentheses because, you know, we don't achieve that. Uh, it doesn't achieve perfect correctness. And this is an interesting new trade-off that we have introduced in this paper, which is, can we do better in terms of query latency versus security? Actually, maybe we can do more research uh, with this respect. So future work that we think that are important to, to tackle uh, immediate task is that to come up with the CBC, RBC that are dynamic, which is not the case for, for, for our work now. We want to reduce CBC overhead, achieve like a better efficiency. And, you know, next task that will require more work is to come with, to design compiler that will suppress other leakage patterns. And 